you'll die before next Christmas. I remember that being something that a friend of mine was told by her doctor when she was in high school. She was battling an eating disorder. And the doctor looked her in the eye and said, you will die before next Christmas. And I can only imagine what it felt like to be the doctor sharing that news. I mean, they, they so many times have to share things that are difficult for people to hear. And yet I can only imagine that it was those words that really changed her life. The, the direct, truthful words of that doctor to share with her that something had to change or she wouldn't be there a year from now. I remember that very vividly and I wonder if this is true, if you agree with this this morning, that we don't really like to hear difficult things, do we? We don't like to hear difficult things and some of you have lived longer than I have and so you've probably heard some difficult things throughout your life. Maybe you've been to the doctor and you've heard the doctor give you the diagnosis of cancer and look you in the eye and tell you what the treatment is gonna be and what the course of life is gonna be. Maybe you've gone to the hospital and the doctors had to tell you that a loved one has passed. Or it could be a variety of things, but, but sometimes we hear difficult things in life and none of us really want to hear it. But you would probably also agree with that sometimes we have to hear difficult things. Would you agree? That sometimes we have to hear difficult things and, and ignorance is not always bliss because it seems like those things will just eventually find us. We can try to ignore reality, but it oftentimes catches up with us. And so while we don't like to hear difficult things, many times it's needed and necessary because it moves us to make changes in our lives based on that information. This morning, we're going to read from a passage of scripture where Jesus shares something very difficult with his listeners. He shares a very difficult truth with his listeners, but in the end, it moved them into a better position and ultimately affects us as well. And so I'm gonna ask you to hang with me this morning as we read through some things that might be difficult for us to accept, but I believe if we do, if we receive it, that it'll actually move us toward a healthier relationship with Jesus. Sound good to you? Okay, I got one yes, we're good. All right. Hey, we're gonna be in Luke chapter four today. So if you have a Bible, you can open that up, either digital or hard copy. If you need a Bible, grab one out of the seat back. You're not stealing from a church, so no lightning bolt's gonna come down. Uh, we're giving that to you to take home and read uh, because we believe that that book, the words in the Bible have been inspired by God. A little history lesson for you. Some of you may be new to scripture. So when I say, go find Luke four, you're like, that's interesting. Um, I don't know what that means. And just so you know, maybe you're new or need a refresher, the Bible is a compilation of many different books written by different people over thousands of years. But we believe that, that all those words were inspired by God. We believe that all scripture is God breathed. So while men wrote it, they were inspired by the same God. And it tells the story of creation through redemption and to eternity. And so we believe all scripture is God breathed. It's all useful for teaching and learning, rebuking, correcting, training, all the good things that we do with it. But when the Bible was originally written, most people couldn't read. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but for most of human history, we were illiterate. We are the most literate people to have ever lived. If you can read, you are highly educated in the history of the world. And so when the Bible was originally written, it didn't have headings and numbers all in it. It was written more like a narrative, more like a story, because people lived in an oral history or an oral tradition. And so they would listen to someone read a passage and they would memorize it. Someone would read something over and over and over and you would memorize it. And so in Jesus' time, it would have been very common for his people to have multiple books of the Bible memorized, at least the first five books of the whole Bible, first five books of the Bible memorized. I mean, can you imagine? We struggle to memorize one verse, it feels like. And they're memorizing chunks of the story, of the narrative. That's how they learned. But as time went on and the Bible was mass produced and literacy rates went up, headings and numbers were put in there as reference points so that we could refer more quickly to different sections of scripture. 
So just so you know, when you open your Bible, it looks the way it does because it helps us find what we need, but we always list it in this order. We always list book, chapter, verse. So if you're ever needing to find something in the Bible, you go to the book, the big number is the chapter, and the smaller number is the verse. And so today we're going to be in Luke chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 14. If you have a Bible, you can follow along. If not, the scripture is on the screen. So here we go. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus grew up in Nazareth. He, he moves on at some point in his life. He begins a ministry, and then he comes back to his hometown, and people are excited to see him. They've heard about some of the miracles he's done, and they're like, this is going to be awesome. Jesus is back. Them listening to him read Isaiah would have, for them, been a great Sunday morning service. You ever come to church, and you're like, today is great. It's a great day. The music was great. The coffee was warm. They had my favorite Panera bagel in the corner over there. It was great, right? The pastor's preaching my favorite verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. I love that one. I have it tattooed. It's fantastic. This is my Sunday, right? That's how people would have felt listening to Jesus read from Isaiah 61 because it was a passage that they had memorized the whole thing. And it was so beautiful because for them, it's a story of salvation. You see, Jesus' says people have a long history of being conquered and enslaved. If you go back and read through the Old Testament, they've been enslaved, they've been conquered, they've been relocated and relocated again. And in the current context of what Jesus is reading, they had been conquered by the Romans. And so they're being held by the Romans, they're having to pay Roman taxes, and so they feel oppressed. And when Jesus reads Isaiah 61, he's reminding them of what something God told them a long time ago that he would send a Messiah, he would send a savior, he would send someone who would set them free, who would liberate them and help them live in the blessing that he promised them years and years ago. So when Jesus is reading this prophecy, they are stoked. This is a great church service for them. Let me show you what really is all in Isaiah 61. Here's more of the context of what he's reading. You see, the Messiah was gonna proclaim good news to the poor. And he was going to bind up the brokenhearted. He was gonna proclaim freedom for the captives and release prisoners from darkness. He was gonna proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and proclaim the day of vengeance. He was gonna comfort those who mourn. He was gonna provide for those in grief. He was gonna bestow a crown of beauty instead of ashes. He was going to anoint with oil of joy. He was gonna rebuild ancient ruins and restore devastated places. Instead of giving shame, he would give a double portion of blessing. Instead of great disgrace, people would receive an inheritance. And so Jesus is back home. He's reading this. People feel great. This is a great Sunday morning service. People would have been nodding their heads. The old men in the back would have been, amen, you know, loving this church service because they love what Jesus is reading. They love him until they don't because the story continues on. So read on, it says, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious, gracious words that came from his lips. So Jesus is reading to them. This is great. He has read this prophecy. This is awesome. And then he makes a pivot. And he says, listen, what I just read to you, Isaiah 61, that has been fulfilled today. So he's basically claiming that he is the Messiah that that passage is prophesying about. And while the people are amazed, I don't know that that meant they were necessarily in agreement. You see, because he's claiming that he is going to be the one to set the captives free and to bring good news to the poor. 
And so I think maybe some of them were thinking, hey, Jesus, you know, you're the hometown boy. Woo, we love you. But you didn't ride in on a horse and chariot with an army to take out the Romans. And I, my pockets don't feel any thicker than when you rode into town. So you haven't given me any blessing. My brother over here is still, still poor. We're still paying taxes to Caesar. Nothing has changed. So how could you say that the Messiah is here, the scripture is fulfilled when nothing has changed. And so they turn from this sort of, you know, agreeable church crowd to this sort of tense environment where they're not really sure what to do with Jesus because he's making a claim that they're not sure they agree with. And so people begin to get a little, you know, antsy. Some people start to kind of call out some jeers and some shouts Listen to what they say. They say, isn't this the son of Joseph? Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did at Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. And so he reads, people love it. He makes a claim. They're getting a little uncomfortable. And then they just start openly combating him. They start kind of going, having this back and forth, right? They're like, uh, aren't you just the son of Joseph? We sort of remember your whole mysterious birth. Don't think we forgot about that, like your mother Mary and that whole thing, right? That, that's still a question for us. And then you've gone off, and like you've got some popularity, and now you're back and you're telling us you're the Messiah. We're just not sure we're believing you, Jesus. Like, don't come back to your hometown with a big head thinking you're more than what you are. Don't think you're more than just the poor kid from Joseph's house. And so people begin to challenge him. And that's not even the difficult part yet. Because what he says next turns them from just a sort of agreeable church crowd into a mob of murderers. Listen to what he tells them next. He says, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel's time, in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. So Jesus comes back home, he reads, people love it, and then they don't. And they turn from this sort of agreeable church crowd to this mob of murderers. What did Jesus say in this passage that was so difficult for them to hear? He must have said something that was so difficult for them to hear, they were willing to murder him. And did you catch basically what he was saying? He basically was saying that he was the Messiah and salvation was for everyone. He was saying he was the Messiah and salvation was for everyone. And I don't think they were so upset about him claiming to be the Messiah. He wasn't the first person in history to claim that. He wasn't the last person in history to claim that. What they were really mad about is that he was willing to give salvation to other people. You see, because their whole life, reading Isaiah 61, that's their passage. Salvation is theirs. The Messiah is for them, not for the heathen down the street. Like, Jesus, do you know what you're saying? You're going to take our blessing, our gift, and you're going to give it to those people over there? They're not deserving of that. Right? And, but Jesus says, no, 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 you, you're missing the point. And he tells some Old Testament stories that, that God has always been about other people. It's never just been about the hometown crowd. And so Jesus is claiming that he's the Messiah and that salvation is for everyone. And that makes them so mad, they're willing to kill him. I mean, I have to imagine they're thinking, well, what's next, Jesus? You're gonna have dinner with a tax collector and call a Samaritan good, right? Where are you headed with your teaching? Because this stuff is radical and we don't want any part of it. Tell you what, they would have really been fired up by what he told his disciples right before he ascended into heaven. Listen to what he says in Matthew 28. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of what? All nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And they would have really been fired up by that. All nations, you're saying the gospel, the good news is for all people? So here is a difficult thing that we need to hear this morning. Jesus loves everyone. Now, you may hear that and think, how is that a difficult thing to hear? That sounds like really good news, doesn't it? Because who's included in everyone? You and me, right? Jesus loves everyone. His love is available for everyone. And that sounds like really good news, and it does, and it is, but have you ever really stopped to think about what that really means? What does that really mean that Jesus loves everyone? You know that neighbor you can't stand? The one who was shooting off discounted fireworks at 11 p.m. last night? <laughs> he loves them. He loves them. How about that political candidate you didn't vote for? He loves them. But the person of the other color you're not sure you like? He loves them. Over to that person who speaks a different language than yours. He loves them. That wayward child who broke your heart, he loves them. Your ex-wife, he loves her. Your ex-husband, he loves him. That person who lives a different lifestyle than you, he loves them. And I'd like to layer something on this that might make it even more difficult for us to hear and receive this morning. I want you to read with me what John records about Jesus' teaching on love. Look what he says in John chapter 13. Jesus says this, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And then John records even more of what Jesus says in a different book that he wrote. He says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know God, whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for us. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is how love is made complete among us so that we have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Now, Let me be clear, nowhere in here does John say you have to affirm everyone's idea. Nowhere in here does he say you have to agree with everything that everybody else agrees with. He doesn't say you have to just accept everything that people say. No, he goes beyond. He says you have to love people despite all of those things. We have to love, he says, like Christ loved us. So let me ask you, do you remember how Christ loved you? Do you remember how Christ loved you? The sin that he has forgiven you of, that he has erased from the record, says it has been cast as far as east is from the west. Do you remember the sacrifice he made? Anthony talked about it in our time of communion where he laid down his very life so that you could live yours now and forever. Do you remember the life that he has given you? Maybe your life was a wreck and then you found Jesus and now it's different. Do you remember what it was like to receive that love? Do you remember the shame he's erased, the guilt he's buried, and the eternity that he has promised for you? If you can remember that, then you maybe have a glimpse of the love that he wants us to show other people. So here's the whole message this morning. If you don't remember anything else, remember this statement. Jesus loves everyone. We are called to be like Jesus. Therefore, we should love everyone. Does that seem logical? Does that seem rational? To say Jesus loves everyone, he has proven that. Then he calls us to be like him. So what do I do with those two things? Well, then I have to love others 
like he loves them. And that's a difficult thing to hear because I don't know if you experience this, but people aren't getting easier to love. And I don't know if it's them or if it's a condition of my heart, but people are not getting easier to love. And yet Christ's ethic of love is as important now as it was 2,000 years ago because people don't care how right we are. People care how much we can love because that's what defines a follower of Christ is how much we can love other people despite how different they might be from us. So let me ask you, where are you when it comes to loving others like Jesus? Where are you in your daily life and the people you work with and the people you surround yourself with? How are you doing when it comes to loving others like Jesus? But then collectively for us as a church, how are we doing at loving others like Jesus loved us? Those aren't easy questions to answer. And in fact, I wouldn't try to answer that on your own. I would get with a small group of people, find a trusted mentor and ask these questions, have a conversation about it. Really do some self-evaluation. How am I doing at loving people that don't look like me, think like me, talk like me, act like me? How am I doing? Because it's, it's easy to love people that look like you and think like you, right? What really puts love to the test is when we love people who don't do the same things we do. And there's no easy answers to those questions, are there? How are we doing when it comes to loving others? And there's so many different answers. Can I give you a couple of options, I think, that are the big ones for you right now that people will kind of just put all in your face, right? Some would say, okay, here's how we answer that question. What we need to do, some would say, is start a political movement and bring morality back to the nation so people can find Jesus. And then some would say, no, no, no. What you need to do is live a quiet life in submission to God and allow your actions to speak louder than your words. And then another group would say, no, what you need to do is get involved in mission work and spread the gospel to every unreached people group ever because that's who God will save. And then another group would say, well, no, what you need to do is fund Christian education and Christian hospitals and Christian nonprofits so that people can experience the compassion of Jesus. And then another group would say, well, no, what we need to do is just accept everyone for who they are and love them no matter what. Have you found yourself in one of those groups? It's like they're waging war against each other. And that's not even outside the church walls. You ever notice how we all try to answer these questions? We're all trying to do what we think is right in our own eyes. But what happens is we cause infighting in the church. And then all of a sudden, the place where people are supposed to find love, they find bitterness and judgment rather than the love of Christ. Does any of this sound familiar in our Christian community? Right? This is a place where people are supposed to find the love of Christ and not the fighting of his followers. And so how do we do this? How do we take the fact that Jesus loves everyone and that we are supposed to be like Jesus and then go out and actually love others like he did? How do we do it? Is there any sort of model, is there any example that we could maybe follow that might give us some help as we go out? Because I think if we try to do it on our own, we'll probably end up like the people listening to Jesus. We'll just start fighting against him and want to go our own way and silently stone him with our jeers and our mocking of his message. So what do we do? How do we get to a place where we could love others? Now, Some of you might have been alive in April of 1963. I won't ask you to raise your hand. Um, I was not one of them. I don't wanna age shame you, but you may have been alive in April of 1963. For the rest of us, we had to learn about this event in history books, okay? And there was these uh, marches that happened throughout the Southern United States in the 1960s. It was part of the civil rights movement. And one famous protest that happened was in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. You, you may see this picture and it may jog your memory. This is like the iconic photo from the Birmingham marches in 1963. I'm not gonna get into the whole backstory. I'm not gonna get into the causes for all this. But, but what I wanna do uncover is that these protesters, these, these marchers, before they went out to combat the segregation that existed in their communities, they signed a pledge They had sort of what they kind of internally called their Ten Commandments, how they were going to act and think and behave when they went out to combat a world that was very different than the one that they wanted to exist. And I read through this list of 10 and I thought, this is so relevant for us today. 
And so what I wanna do is share a list of 10 things that we might be able to do that might put us in a better position to love others like Jesus loved us. And so I'm just gonna go through a list of 10. You can take screenshots if you want. If you wanna text notes to that phone number we gave you earlier, you can have a list of all these. But here we go, number one. They would make a pledge before they went out that they would meditate on the life and teachings of Jesus. I mean, could you imagine what would happen if we meditated daily on the life and teachings of Jesus? I mean, just imagine his attitude, his character, his thinking would translate into our hearts and maybe we would have a better attitude and a better heart when we are interacting with a lost world. Number two, they would seek justice and reconciliation, not simply victory. That's a tough one. What if we sought justice and reconciliation with others and not just victory? You think that might improve our witness and maybe put us in a position to engage with the lost world rather than to always be fighting it? And does this mean we have to agree with everyone? No. Does this mean we have to affirm everyone? No. I mentioned my friend in high school who was battling the eating disorder. The most unloving thing we could have told her was, how you feel on the inside is what's true because she would have died. The most loving thing we could have do was tell her the truth in the context of a relationship. And so when we choose to love others, it doesn't mean we have to bite our tongues and, and bow to uh, other principles or to forget our principles, but it means to have a heart that is conditioned to say, I see a person in need of rescuing, not a person that I need to beat or to have the right argument over. Do you see the difference? Right, what if we sought justice and reconciliation? I think it might change a lot of lives. Number three, what if we walked and talked in the manner of love? That's a beautiful mental picture, isn't it? Walking and talking in the manner of love because God is love. I wonder if that could disarm the enemy and disrupt the narrative and put us in closer proximity to those who are lost. Number four, what if we prayed daily that God would use us to help everyone be free? And that doesn't necessarily mean an earthly freedom. We're talking more about spiritual freedom because people are living every day in spiritual bondage to their sin. And the result of that is death. And we have the good news of Jesus Christ that for those who would believe in him, they would have a forgiveness of their sins and would live forever with him. And so how dare we hoard that truth to ourselves and say it's only for us when we have the good news that they need that can set them free from the captivity of their own minds and hearts. You see, what if we pray daily? Number five, what if we sacrificed our personal wishes so that others could be free? That's preaching selflessness. That what if we denied ourselves? It reminds me of a verse some of you may have memorized. that says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. That's a tough one, but what if we tried that? What if we, when we engaged with the world, what if that was our posture, that we tried to put others before ourselves? Number six, what if we treated others with courtesy and dignity, no matter the situation? Does this mean we have to bite our tongues and be quiet when we hear something that we don't agree with? No, but it might mean you can't just go unleash on people on social media and feel good about that. What if we served others regularly? You know, I think sometimes people, they, they encounter Christians and they're like, you just wanna convert me. You don't really care about me. Do you see the difference? Maybe we ought to care about people before we try to convert people. Sometimes we just wanna go out and be victorious and convert as many people to Christ as we can. How about we go out and care for as many people as we can and let Christ do the saving work that only he can do? Might that change our influence in the world if we cared about people as much as we wanted them to convert. Number eight, what if we refrain from violence of fist, tongue, and heart? Now, I have to imagine we're pretty good with the first one. I don't think any of you are running around punching people you don't like. 
okay? And if you are, please let us know. We'll, we'll help you through that. We'll get you some counseling, okay? But the tongue, that's a harder one, isn't it? There's a whole passage in scripture that talks about the tongue being the thing that sets our world on fire. That much like a big ship is controlled by a very small rudder, so is the destruction in our lives sometimes is controlled by this tiny little muscle that we just can't seem to get a hold of. What if we refrain from violence of fist, tongue, and heart? Number nine, what if we took good care of ourselves, both internally and externally, so that we could be ready when the time comes to be a witness for Christ? And number 10, what if we followed the leader? Sometimes we wanna be our own leaders, don't we? We're gonna lead ourselves. Usually that doesn't turn out well. What if we followed the leader? What if we follow the model of Christ and how he dealt with other people and let that be our influence? Not what every political pundit and Christian author has to say, but what does Christ say about how we should interact with lost people? And let that be our guide and follow him. I just wonder if this list of 10 things could be something that could really change our relationship with the lost world. Now, I know this doesn't address everything, and some of you may have more questions than answers that I gave today, and that's okay. I think it's okay for you to leave church sometimes and have questions, but don't try to answer them on your own. Find a small group, find a trusted mentor, somebody you can talk to and wrestle through your doubts with. I didn't, I didn't deal with governments and laws and policies and regulations, mainly because I'm not qualified to swim in those waters. I think we're called to swim in spiritual waters. You see, because spiritual is where we thrive. You see, God is spirit, and we're called into a life, a spiritual life. And so while we may not have dealt with all the policies and regulations and all those things, what we have covered today is spiritual ground, heart ground, which is really where we need to start. So many of us, I think so many of us want to run out there with our hands and change the world, and we just drag our hearts along. Hopefully, it'll catch up. I think it's the wrong place to start. Maybe if we lead from the heart, we let our hearts be changed by Christ and then our hands will be motivated and the work that we do will be fruitful, not troublesome. And so I understand that this didn't address everything today. But if you don't remember anything else we've talked about today, put this in your mind. Jesus loves everyone. We are called to be like Jesus. So we should love everyone. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's easy. And it will be difficult. But it doesn't change the call. How many of you, show of hands, have been to a wedding this year? Anybody been to a wedding? It's wedding season. You know, everybody's getting married. Everybody wants to do it outside because that makes sense. And it's blazing hot. Let's get married in a barn. <laughs> Can't stand that. And if you've been to a wedding, then odds are you've heard a passage read to you about love. It's a very famous passage on love. And it's not being used out of context at a wedding because love applies there. But its original context had nothing to do with marriage. Paul wrote a letter to a church that he had planted in the city of Corinth. And Corinth was this wealthy city with a lot of diversity of people and ideas. Sounds very similar to a place I live that's very wealthy and has a diversity of people and ideas. And they must have been struggling with how to engage with their culture because he writes them a whole section about how to love people. And he calls it the way of love. And I just wanna end our time together by you listening to this passage. And I'm gonna read from the message uh, paraphrase translation this morning because I think it uses some language that might just stir some new thoughts in our minds. So you can close your eyes if you choose or you can leave them open. Just I want you to listen to what Paul says as he describes the way of love to the people in Corinth, but I think really directly to us. He says, if I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day. And if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump and it jumps, but I don't love, 
I'm nothing. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, no matter what I believe or what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. You see, because love never gives up. And love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have and love doesn't strut. It doesn't have a swelled head and it doesn't force itself on others. Love isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. Love doesn't keep score of the sins of others and it doesn't revel when others grovel. No, you see, love takes pleasure in the flowering of truth and love puts up with anything. It trusts God always and it always looks for the best. It never looks back, but keeps going to the end. And he keeps going with this thought. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday and praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. We know only a portion of the truth and what we say about God is always incomplete. But when the complete arrives, that is Jesus, our incompleteness will be canceled. You see, we don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist, but it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then, see it as clearly as God sees us now, knowing him directly just as he knows us. But for right now, until that completeness comes, we have three things to do. Trust steadily in God. Hope unswervingly and love extravagantly. And the best of those three is love. Jesus loves everyone, including, including you and I. And we are called to be like Jesus. So therefore we are called to love others. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us. Even when we didn't deserve it, we certainly weren't right. We certainly didn't believe all the right things or do all the right things when you died for us. While we were still sinners, you died for us. You loved us beyond the sin. And then you call us to do that with others in our lives. Yes, we should be committed to truth, Lord. And yes, we should be committed to seeing a world come to you. But if we don't love and we've got nothing. So help us to be like you and to love everyone just as you love them. God, I remember when my first child was born and it was like this extra chamber of love opened in my heart. I'm sure most parents know that feeling. It's like there's more love to be had. There's not a limit to it. So God, maybe, maybe would you open an extra chamber of love in our hearts for those in the world who don't know you, that we could see them as a creation in need of rescuing, not as a creature that needs judgment. That's yours alone. So God, be with us. Help us to be like you and help us to love just like you love. We ask those things in your name, Jesus. Amen.